All right, so hear the word of the Lord from, we're going to read chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and then uh, Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to read Nehemiah 8, 1 through 18. Uh, Chapter 7. Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors, appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. Now chapter 8, 1 through 18. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people uh, were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose and beside them stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseah on his right hand and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord and the, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book, from the law of God. Clearly, they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to, the all, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the Lord, the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of fathers' houses of all the, of all the people with the priests and Levites came together to Ezra, the, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all, the ta- all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees <clears throat> to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths for from the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, to the day that the, the people of Israel had not done so. And there were, there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, 
from the first day to the last day. He read the book, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was solemn assembly according to the rule. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. A hand for Matt Van Zandt, everyone. That was a long reading. Good job. Thank you. Peace be with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dodds, I'm one of the pastors here, and today we are continuing our study of Nehemiah. As, we, as we've said, the book of Nehemiah tells the story of God's people rebuilding the broken down walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah is all about building a new Jerusalem, a new city of God, which is precisely what the church is called to do today. And so we've been turning to the book of Nehemiah in order to learn how we should go about doing that. When the church is in disrepair, what should Christians be doing? In the midst of a society that cares very little for the pursuit of holiness or the word of God, what should be our posture and our action as his people? Last week, we witnessed a series of plots that were foiled by Nehemiah as Sanballat and his compatriots attempted to scare the Jews into abandoning the wall's completion. We saw that as God's people, we must not only trust the Lord and and build courageously, but we must also employ wisdom and discernment and a good bit of cleverness to overcome our enemies. As we build God's house, We truly have nothing to fear, no accusations to disprove. We have a great advocate who has not only called us to this work, but he himself is the chief architect who is guiding and leading all of our building, all of our efforts. And today we've come to chapters 7 and 8 where the people of Israel are re-entering their home city. And so we'll be talking about their return We'll be talking about the particular significance of God's law being read and understood by the people and what that means for us as we seek to build God's city among the cities of men. So as we pick up our story this morning, the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt. The work seemingly is done and Nehemiah commits the security of Jerusalem to reliable, God-fearing men. Now the fact, I find this interesting, the fact that Nehemiah mentions singers and Levites in verse 1 might surprise us, but if the city and not just the temple are being largely guarded by Levites and singers, it, it signals a change. It's no longer just the temple that is holy. It's the wider city around it. The whole city is becoming holy. The whole city, in some sense, is being set apart. And as we'll see in chapter 13, the guarding of the gates of the city is not just a matter of of military security, but of, of real moral significance. Those overseeing the gates determine who and what is and is not allowed to enter the city. And so that sense that, that Nehemiah brings here really is this, it adds to the sense of Jerusalem being a holy city, of being a city set apart for a particular work. So here we are in chapter 7. Ezra has seen to the rebuilding of the temple in the book of Ezra. Nehemiah has seen to the rebuilding of the city walls. And so the great tasks that once laid before the people have been completed, but something is missing Let's read in verse 4 again. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. So the city is rebuilt, but there are no people. It's God's people that are missing from the city. The city must be repopulated. And by recalling the people into the city through this assembly, God is leading Nehemiah not to just merely fill the city, but to ensure the people's return to Jerusalem so that they can reclaim their roots as God's people. And this is terribly important, terribly important, because at this time, Israel had been living in exile from Jerusalem for 70 years. 
They had been refugees for 70 years. But now they are being called out of exile. They're being called back to their home. The book of Nehemiah began with the Israelites being allowed to return to their land by the decree of a Persian king. All of these markers, ascending king, a long exile, a return home to the land, that would have brought something specific to Israel's mind. Does anyone want to venture to take a guess of what that is? Feel free to speak. The Exodus. The Exodus, right? This is the story of the Exodus. This is another picture of the Exodus. Israel is coming home from exiles. God's people are coming out of exile. They're entering the land. Let's go back to the text. And all the people gathered, this is in chapter 8, and all the people gathered as one man, it's very important, one body, one people, all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had committed Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. I wonder if we set up something in the courtyard like this and said, show up here tomorrow at 6 a.m. We're going to read the book of the law from 6 a.m. to noon. I wonder what kind of RSVP onslaught we would, we would see. But it's worth considering why we would laugh. It is worth considering. So we'll get to that. So all of the returned exiles have gathered into the city, and this occurs, according to verse 2, on the first day of the seventh month. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail here. We could, but we don't have time but the seventh month was, was really the principal month of the Jewish calendar. It was the Sabbath month. In this month was contained the Feast of Trumpets, which was a, a New Year's festival. It contained Yom Kippur, which was the Jewish Day of Atonement. And also the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a, a feast week that was associated directly with the Exodus. We read about it at the end of, our, of chapter 8 today. The Feast of Booths also as it's known. But it's a big month. It's just full of feasting and fasting, of celebration and remembering. But the people gather, and they make this incredible request. They ask, they ask Ezra to read the book of the law to them. This would have been the, the first five books of the Jewish Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they even construct an elevated wooden platform for Ezra to stand on so that he can be seen by everybody. Now, why, why is this, why is what's happening here so important? Why is this request so significant? Well, a public reading like this is exactly what was prescribed in the book of Deuteronomy. Let's look at that really quickly. It's the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. And Moses commanded them... At the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, also the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law. So this is really intriguing. It's not Ezra and Nehemiah. It's not the Levites who gather the people up and institute this reading. It's the people who ask for God's word to be read to them. The temple 
has been set apart and consecrated. It's been made holy. The, the walls of Jerusalem have been set apart and consecrated. They've been made holy. And now the people are being set apart and consecrated through God's word and made holy. As evangelical Christians, we do tend to have a love-hate relationship with the book of the law. <laughs> we tend to enjoy Genesis, maybe half of Exodus, <laughs> maybe all of Exodus if we're generous. But we often leave it at that. But our fathers and mothers in the faith had a love-love relationship with God's law. King, it was King David who said himself, I rejoice in the law of the Lord. And this was a man who did not have the New Testament. He delighted in God's law. A man after God's own heart who said, I love God's law. If you remember Psalm 119, where he just gushes over and over and over. Lord, your, your, your word brings light to my eyes. It helps me see. It brings light to my path. It actually gladdens my heart. It makes wise the simple. And then over and over again, what does he say? Teach me, teach me, teach me. Teach me your statutes, teach me your commands, teach me your ways. Israel enters the city, and, and just like the psalmist of 119, they, the first thing they want to hear is God's law. And not just to listen to it, but to submit to it, to be reminded of it, to be reminded by it, and to obey it. That's what's interesting about the idea of hearing the word of God. When you hear something, you have to submit. It's a submission, it's an act of submission. To hear in the Jewish culture was to obey. To hear, to listen, was to obey. And it's incredible that they asked for God's, that they're, they are back in their home after 70 years away, and before they get to living in the city, they say, we want to hear God's word to us. They want to see God's faithfulness to Adam and Eve outside the garden. They want to be reminded of the covenant that God made with Noah and Abram. They want to hear God's work in the life of Joseph and Isaac and Jacob. They want to know God's promises and his goodness afresh in light of their ancestors who were taken out of slavery in Egypt. They want to remember the Exodus and Mount Sinai and Rahab and the tabernacle. There was that much excitement about listening to God's word. <laughs> That's the level we're talking about. They want to hear God's commands in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They want to hear from the God who teaches them how to live. And it is, it's an invitation and it's a challenge to us today to have that same kind of relationship with God's law, a love love relationship. Our world is just one big walking panic attack sometimes, it seems. But it's why it is, it is at least a little bit, if not a lot, responsible for how worn out you feel. How aimless you feel, or how aimless you're tempted to feel. We have so many competing, competing voices trying to talk to us and to help us make sense of what's going on. We have opposing political voices. We have outraged social voices. We have voices that try to get us to worry or not worry about inflation. Voices that say monkeypox and voices that say COVID and voices that say abuse and trauma. It's, it really is overwhelming. And it provokes so much in us. Some of us pr are provoked to take control, take control of every situation. Some of us are provoked to be like, I'm just, I'm gonna Homer Simpson it, you know, into the hedge. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm gonna get out of this. Where's the unsubscribe button to everything? 
but in all that is provoked in us. Does, does this, does this provoke in us an insatiable need for God to speak? Amidst all the voices, do we long like Israel to be set apart and consecrated and oriented by the words of our creator? All the voices that are competing for our attention, does it cause us to say, Lord, I need to know what you say. Are we hoping that all those voices just go away? Or I'm sure that we do. Maybe instead of waiting for that day, we might turn to our brother or our sister and just ask them, would you please read to me the words of the one whom I can trust? Will you open the book of the words of the one I can trust? Do we need and delight in God's word that much? I mean, do we even come here this morning to this gathering in such need? Lord, I need to hear from you. We should. We should come. Now, the assembly here in Jerusalem was not merely this just long scriptural teaching session. It was also, we can see, it was also a corporate act of worship. Ezra leads the assembly in praising the Lord. The people are raising their hands, answering, amen, amen, and, and bowing before the Lord in worship. This is a, what we're seeing here in chapter 8 really is, it's, it's a, in this first part of chapter 8, is a, a covenant renewal gathering of the people. God is welcoming and ordering his people in a way that reapplies and ratifies his covenant promises to them. And if we take a moment, just a moment to consider it, to consider what we see in these scriptures, I believe that we can see elements of our Sunday gathering here. We can see the call to worship as Ezra and the Levites welcome the people into the city. Come, come, the Lord is calling you. We can see the reading of God's word we can see singing. <laughs> we can see eating a meal together in peace and celebration with God and with others. Confession of sin we're going to see next week, but it is there. God has brought his people back, and the first thing that he does is he establishes, he reestablishes the covenant that he has kept with his people, reminds them again of who they are. Reminds them again of who he is. Now, here's a big difference between Israel's experience and, and ours. Israel had to wait 70 years for this covenant renewal. They had to wait 70 years for it. As the church, we only have to wait seven days. Every Sunday, God reapplies he reminds, he ratifies his covenant with us. We come in. We come in with the work of our week, the sin of our week. We come and we lay it as an offering before the Lord. He calls to us. That's why it's the call to worship. It's the Lord calling us. It wasn't just Matt standing up here. I know that we have to sort of like view this with some eyes of poetry and imagination, but it wasn't just Matt standing up here. It was God's voice saying, come. Our, our feet are within your gates, O Jerusalem. We're now in the city ourselves. We confess our sin and it's forgiven. We're unburdened by our sin. We share peace with one another because we have peace with God and peace with one another through Christ. We're taught and consecrated by God's word. We eat at a table together and we're fed and strengthened to then be sent out into the world to open up our own tables and to share our own lives and to share that grace that God has shared with us. It does, it takes a little bit of an imagination to see all of the decoration that's there, but all of that is there. We only have to wait seven days to experience this gathering where God renews 
covenant with us. And I'm telling you, we, we, all of us, we need the regular, reapplied, ratified covenant renewal service of God every week. It's the only time that I'll really say, like, you need to go to church. Like, I usually don't like that phrase. <laughs> we go to a gathering. Yes, we do. But this is the most real thing. Truly, this is the most real thing that we do as a people every week. And by real, what I mean is that it's grounded in the deepest reality of our existence. God is with us. He's here. He's transacting with us. He's loving us. He's delighting in us. We're delighting in him. We're delighting in one another. We're singing songs, which if you think about it, singing songs, it's like glorified speech. It's like decorated talking. Everything is decorated and lovely. God calls us, he forgives us, he receives our praise and our offerings. See, if this gathering is just a few songs and a message, then you can come or not come in the same way that you go to or not go to a conference. But if it's a ritual that engages in the renewing of God's covenant with us, then how could we, how could we miss it and not notice the void? How could we not say this really is necessary for us? So, Ezra is reading the law. He's kind of acting like a Moses here, right? It's being taught to the people. And how, they are, how are they responding? It's, it's understandable. How are they responding? Nehemiah says that all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Can you imagine, though, 70 years of, of living away from your home and of looking at it in disrepair? 70 years, and over the last number of weeks, working to make it, working to rebuild the city, and now we're home. And what we hear are God's promises, his commands, his faithfulness, his statutes, his promises kept. The people are brought to tears. And how do Nehemiah and the rest respond? Let's read. Then Nehemiah said to them, he said to them, go Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine. So eat the best and drink the best. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Amazing. Nehemiah says, now is not the time to mourn or grieve. Now is the time for rejoicing. In light of what the Lord has done, now is the time for celebration. You're hearing his word we want you to hear his faithfulness, his goodness, his loveliness, his wisdom, his power, his might. God has brought his people back into the city he promised them. And just like in Egypt, the exodus does not begin with mourning and repentance. It begins with thanksgiving and worship. Joy was meant to be at the heart of Israel's life. And, and the festal days, that's... They're important for that very reason. So the leaders tell the brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. They're, they're encouraged to express their confidence in his power, in his support, to delight in his gifts, to delight in their love for one another as brothers and sisters. They're assured of the Lord's delight and joy in them as he's the one who has brought them out of exile into the city. They are his people and he in tends for their good. So, Jordan, we too here, we're, we're being developed, we're being formed as a festal people, as a people given to festivity and celebration. Advent 
Advent forms us into Christmas people. Lent forms us into Easter people. Gosh, all the things we do, confessing our sin, it, it forms us into, into deep and penitent people, humble people. And our exodus from the kingdom of darkness is forming us more and more into joyful people. Perhaps nothing distinguishes, distinguishes us from the rest of the world so greatly as our joy. In Christ, our city has been rebuilt, and so that means that his favor is already upon us. And we too must remember that God's favor is with us because he is still building us as a church. Throughout scripture, joy is an effect of being in the presence of God. It's not the effect of COVID disappearing or inflation leveling off or Russia leaving Ukraine. Though we hope for all of those things and we pray for those things. No, it's the presence of God with us, Father, Son, and Spirit. And it's not a matter of us responding to the joy of God's presence. It's about us in this gathering being caught up in the joy of God himself. Because right now, God is here, and he comes rejoicing to us, unto us, towards us. He comes dancing and singing and exalting. He comes in triumph. And we, as sons and daughters, old and young, prince and princesses, we get to join with the song. It's his joy that we enter. Nehemiah puts it this way. He says, do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word strength there in verse 10 is actually the word fortress. So he says to Israel, essentially, yes, the temple is rebuilt. Yes, the walls are rebuilt. You have your city back. But it's not your fortress. The joy of the Lord is your true fortress. That's your true home. Same goes for us, Sojourn. So as we, as we close here, what have we learned from Nehemiah today? Very quickly. And as we continue to build God's city here in Houston, we, we must pursue we must develop a, a love-love relationship with God's law, with his word. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy included. It's filled with his promises, his commands, his faithfulness, his counsel, his direction. May we, may we long to be, may we long to love his word like David describes. Secondly, with so many competing voices in our world, we need to hear the words of God we need to be consecrated by them, set apart by them, oriented towards God through his word and his commands. And we do that most certainly. Most certainly we're reminded of that in, in such a way during the Sunday gathering on the Lord's Day. And finally, in knowing his word, we must make it a priority to cultivate joy in the Lord, to remember, because... <laughs> I think a big part of what helped them remember was the exodus. He's brought us out of slavery into our land. In Christ, we have been brought from the power of sin, from, from, from slavery to sin, and we've been brought into his body. Developing such a joy will be a great source of strength for us as God's people. And in Christ, we have more reason to rejoice than, than anyone on the, on the earth. And in Christ, we get to open our tables and lives and share that joy with others. Let's pray. Holy and gracious Father, we thank you for this day, the day on which, Lord, you have again renewed your covenant with us, renewed us in your covenant. Lord, you've taken burdens off of our shoulders. You've taken the offerings of Lord, the, the work of our week, 
our offerings of thanksgiving, our offerings of praise, or they've risen to you like, like incense in the temple. And we, we pray that, they, that today that it's a pleasing aroma. God, will you, will you help us to be a people who love your word, who like Israel here long to have the word read to us, long to have the word taught to us, long to have the word administered like good food and medicine to our bodies, to our souls, to our minds. Renew us by your word. Light our paths by your word. Lord, help us to see, gladden our hearts, make us wise. Lord, all by your word. And Lord, may we be people, by your grace, would you make us more and more people who are given to festivity, who are given to celebration. It seems so hard in a world like ours where we're gonna try and squeeze out some kind of joy or, or, or notice some kind of like corner of the room where we can, where we can celebrate. Lord, would you, would you help us to see the greatest reality that we have been brought from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light and that that would fuel our joy, our festivity, our generosity, our humility. Lord, we can't muster that on our own. And so we look to you. We wait for you. We wait for you and we trust you. Help us. Help us, we pray. We ask it in your name. Amen.